National Democratic Congress. The nation builders. Your Excellency Professor Nana Jenopukwa Jeman, our incoming Vice President, come January 7, 2025, and the first female Vice President ever in Ghana. Thank you. Kindly resume your seats. Thank you very much and uh, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, let me thank you, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, for accepting to join me for this governance forum, especially as we had to schedule it for the evening because of numerous campaign activities. We also had a very good meeting with the leadership of the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council this afternoon uh, before getting ready to join you this evening. And this evening I want to speak about governance. I moved to speak about governance because the way we are administering governance in our dear country has brought Ghana to a crossroads. Injustice is eating our society away as our economy inflicts untold hardships on millions of suffering Ghanaians. In the last few years, the World Bank reports that 870,000 of our people have slipped below the poverty line. And our own Ghana Statistical Service says that 1.7 million of our fellow Ghanaians are multidimensionally poor under the Akufado Baumia administration. My dear brothers and sisters, at this crossroads, we have no option but to come together in unity as one people who put our nation first to give us a chance to succeed. For Ghana to be successful again, there's an urgent need for a reset of our governance and our democratic systems. This can only happen if this current NPP government is rejected at the polls of 7th December 2024. Our democratic institutions have been put under great strain these last eight years. And all the gains we made in strengthening our democratic institutions since 1992 have been severely eroded. Ladies and gentlemen, this horror movie Ghanaians have been subjected to over the last eight years must come to an end. Clearly, the pledge to protect the public peace was just a hollow promise. And indeed, as some people say humorously, they have not only emptied the public peace, they have stolen the peace itself. The insatiable greed of appointees of this administration has not even spared the environment, including our water bodies, and our forest reserves. The catastrophic failure of this administration has not only led to an upset in corruption, but also to disrespect for the freedoms and rights of our citizens, the high-handed throwing of our citizens into remand custody and depriving them of food and medical care. This is a government that lacks integrity, transparency, and accountability. They will not accept responsibility for the hardships they have inflicted on our society. They still believe and insist that they are not responsible for the damage to the economy. They maintain that we cannot hold them accountable for skyrocketing the national debt from 120 billion Ghana cities in 2016 to 767 billion Ghana cities in 2024 and with very little to show for it. They just will not accept that compelling the central bank to print more than 70 billion Ghana cities 
created an increase in inflation to about 54% and led to the Bank of Ghana posting a loss of over 60 billion Ghana cities. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe firmly that the main reason for democratic governance is to improve the living condition of all our citizens, including the most vulnerable, like persons living with disabilities, our retirees and pensioners, and young people who are out of school and need jobs in a tangible, sustainable, and equitable manner. Democracy must be meaningful to citizens. Democracy must deliver justice to the people. In a democracy, citizens must be free to criticize the government without hearing a knock on their doors at night from partisan operatives. In a true democracy, citizens, including journalists, security personnel, workers of the Electoral Commission, teachers, nurses, and doctors, must be able to go about their daily duties without looking over their shoulders to check who is following them and who is misconstruing their actions and their democratic choices. Indeed, their phones must be free from bugging and monitoring. Bad governance threatens inclusive and sustainable development and undermines democracy. In other words, people must be free to speak their minds. As politicians, it should be clear to us from recent happenings that the people of Ghana, especially the youth, have begun to be more assertive about their deserved aspirations. They are no longer hoodwinked by the superficial compliance and principled pos positions, propaganda, mere rhetoric, abuse of vested power, and divisive and irrational tribal or religious politics. The youth of Ghana are seeking fundamental, drastic, and wholesale reforms to the crippling canker of corruption and elitist government. And therefore, as a political leader, I'm prepared and ready to provide that leadership. <laughs> and have a genuine commitment to meeting the needs and aspirations of our people in this century. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why this evening I speak of governance. And this is why I'm offering myself as a servant leader, as one who is prepared to work with all of you to halt the declining confidence in our democratic and governance institutions. All true patriots of Ghana will feel sad reviewing the report of the CDD Afrobarometer Round 10 survey. And I urge every one of you to study that report. The report chronicles the increasing loss of faith in our democratic institutions. We must urgently halt the decay of our institutions, reset, and begin to chart a dignifying path forward. And I believe we can do that. No barriers erected by the deeds or misdeeds of this government will be too steep to surmount from January 7, 2025, when by the grace of the Almighty God and the permission and votes of the Ghanaian people, I am sworn into office as president. My brothers and sisters, I'm determined to work with you to save our democracy, and it will not matter whose ox is God. Combating corruption and ensuring transparent governance is a must. I'm determined to cure the canker of corruption in our country. Corruption is intertwined with bad governance and represents a manifestation of carefully crafted schemes by government officials and their families and friends to benefit their parochial, narrow, selfish ends. Today, we think about the PDS scandal, the SML scandal, the Japa and the numerous other scandals. I mean, just think about Data Bank, belonging to the then Minister of Finance, the President's cousin, profiting from our national borrowing. There's also the number 12 investigative report by Anas Arimi Anas, which led and culminated in the murder of Ahmed Hussein Swali after implicating the presidency. Think about the Pualugu Dam scandal and the many others that have gone uninvestigated. 
We can go further and think about the COVID-19 expenditure scandals and the Sputnik V scandals in which people who were voted to protect our interests rather decided to profit from the pandemic. The list is endless. And while we reflect on these acts of corruption, not even to mention the $58 million National Cathedral scandal, let us ask ourselves, what has happened to these brazen acts of corruption? What has happened to the perpetrators? When corruption goes unchecked and unpunished, impunity prevails, and the country is consigned to hardship. And this is how corruption has led to hardship that Ghanaians are suffering today. And this is another reason why we must show this corrupt NPP government the exit on 7 December 2024 to pave the way for scrutiny and accountability. My brothers and sisters, the simple fact is that a vote for Baumia will be a disastrous third-term vote for Akufado and his corrupt friends and family administration. This is not a quest for witch hunting, but it's a genuine desire by Ghanaians to see public officers held to account for the public trust that was placed in them. Fighting corruption requires courage and principle. I will ensure meritorious appointments and allow the systems of transparency and accountability and fettered space to work. And I know my level. Even if someone says I have no level because I served only one term, I know my level is definitely not to be a clearing agent. My dear friends and fellow Ghanaians, the John Mahama and Nana Jane NDC government will adhere to the substantive constitutional expectation of separation of powers to allow checks and balances to work. We will adequately resource the independent constitutional bodies, will revitalize media freedoms, and hold regular stakeholder engagements and presidential media encounters in the Flagstaff House. We will not be like a government that had held only one media press and for the next seven years refused to meet the press. Our administration will establish a governance advisory council and I aim to improve political governance, help curb corruption and ensure the respect for human rights in this country. Membership of this council will include representatives of civil society organizations religious leaders, traditional leaders, academia, labor, and ordinary Ghanaians. Every year, this Governance Advisory Council will hold a stakeholder forum and will release a report on the state of human rights, corruption, and our governance to serve as a guide for the government to know whether we're on the right track regarding issues of governance. My brothers and sisters, you have heard about Operation Recover All the Loot. This is going to be one of our tools to combat corruption and make it a high risk endeavor for any person. Operation Recover All the Loot will investigate, prosecute, and recover the proceeds of corruption using both local and foreign investigative expertise to achieve this objective. Closely linked to oral will be legislation to prohibit political appointees, political exposed persons, and all seven public officials from purchasing state assets. We shall address the detrimental phenomenon of state capture 
by establishing a state assets registry. As I have assured the chiefs of the Ghana states, we will open an inquiry into the sale of stolen government lands and the implementation of the Accra Redevelopment Policy. And let me assure you, the investigation into the looting of government lands will not be restricted to Accra alone. We are aware of the developments that have taken place in Kumasi, Ho, and Tamale. And we will extend the oral into all the 16 regions. And I commit to rigorously implement the recommendations of this inquiry. <laughs> to ensure value for money and transparency in the award of contracts, we will set up an independent value for money office, which will be responsible for scrutinizing any government procurement that is above five million dollars, or as Parliament may determine. Parliament may determine a lower figure that is left with Parliament to decide. But every contract or procurement that is above a certain figure will be subject to independent value for money audit. The Public Procurement Act of 2003, Act 663, as amended, will further be amended to make single source and restricted tendering an exception rather than the norm. Working with the judiciary, special courts will be established to prosecute and sanction persons in whom adverse findings are made by the Auditor General's report and by Parliament. We will strongly support the Auditor General to enforce the surcharge powers to retrieve embezzled funds with interest. Our commitment is to review and enforce the assets declaration regime to promote transparency and combat corruption. And in this regard, I will require all members of my administration to declare their assets within 30 days of assuming office. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the recent report from the Afrobarometer survey in Ghana reveals depressing reports about our institutions. The Ghanaian public has lost trust in many of these institutions. Collectively, we must do more to rebuild that trust. Our administration will review the codes of conduct for public office holders to promote ethical leadership, professionalism, and efficiency. We must make the public sector work for the people by being responsive to their needs, and we must demonstrate humility, modesty, and sacrifice in office. We will also pass and implement the revised Internal Audit Agencies Bill to address malfeasance in public agencies. For almost eight years, the government has deliberately and systematically worked to weaken and undermine the independence of the judiciary, the electoral commission, and the audit service for their own parochial purposes. Our human rights record, including press freedom, has suffered just as the fight against corruption has. Journalists have been hounded and cowed into silence and self-censorship. But I can assure you that there is hope. The NDC under my leadership is ready and willing to work with Ghanaians and our key stakeholders in civil society, our traditional leaders, our development partners, to restore good governance into our beloved country. And as I've said many times already, I'll drastically reduce the size of government in order to reduce expenditure by appointing not more than 60 ministers of state. Indeed, we started working on this by realigning and merging ministries, departments, and agencies. And we will appoint highly efficient, effective, and smart appointees to eliminate duplication and waste. We will scrap the payment of ex gratia. We will scrap the payment of ex gratia.
the disparities between Article 71 office holders and the wider public service will be fixed by establishing the long overdue Independent Emoluments Commission. And this will happen by merging the functions of the Presidential Commission on Emoluments with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. In addition, we will continue and complete the constitution review process that was started by our late president, Professor John Evans Atamels of blessed memory. I believe independent constitutional bodies must be strengthened rather than weakened. And I'm referring to the National Media Commission, the National Commission for Civic Education, the Electoral Commission, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, the Office of the Special Prosecutor, and the Audit Service. On justice delivery, resetting Ghana to work in a 24-hour economy that will create jobs also means that justice must not only be served, must, but must be seen to be served. The next NDC government will support the judiciary to enhance access to justice and restore confidence in that important constitutional organ of state. Our administration will depoliticize the administration of justice, will respect the independence of the judiciary, and will see to the expeditious determination of cases through more automation, virtual hearings, use of technology, and motivation of members of the judicial service to consider a shift system under the 24-hour economy to hear more cases. There is no reason why we cannot have ninth courts and provide safety and security for litigants and members of the judicial service. Ladies and gentlemen, prisoners are human and must be treated fairly. We will do this by establishing courts within the precincts of prisons, just as has been done within the precincts of the Nsawan Medium Security Prison. We will ensure better care for our prisoners by expanding the prisons and providing separate blo uh, blocks for remand prisoners so that they are not joined up with convicted prisoners. We will ensure improvement in their feeding and their medical care. While improving the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act 2010, Act 798, to deliver justice, we will conduct a comprehensive review of legal education. There are huge shortfalls in both residential and office accommodation across all the security services. These we will aggressively tackle from our first day in office. We will enhance medical packages for serving and retired personnel and their families. We will ensure continuous review of UN operational allowances. We will review the appointment of the heads of security agencies and parliamentary oversight over security and intelligence agencies and actively engage the services of private security organizations who adhere to decent work and provide fair wages for their employees. I therefore you wish to use this opportunity to urge our men and women in uniform to remember to abide by their oaths of office, to protect and defend our constitution before, during, and after this general election. Finally, on security, I call for calm to prevail in Boko. I appeal to all sides to exercise restraint and silence the weapons. Resolving the Boko conflict will be one of my first priorities when I become president. The need to champion sustainable development stares us in the face as our water bodies stand more polluted than we have ever witnessed in our country's history. While pursuing green technologies, our administration will promote sustainable and responsible mining. 
As I've said before, no member of my government will be allowed to engage in mining. I repeat, my appointees will be prohibited from engaging in mining to prevent conflict of interest. And as I've said, any appoint appointee who wants to be a miner can go and be a miner. But you can't be a miner and serve in our government. And please rest assured that every government appointee and party official who flouts the mining laws will be swiftly dealt with. Irresponsible and illegal mining, Galamse, would be fought strenuously using regulation and mining in forest reserves will not be allowed because our water bodies take their source from these forest reserves. If we destroy these forest reserves, it will lead to a destruction of our water bodies. Small-scale mining is legal and will continue to be the preserve of Ghanaian nationals. As we undertake inventory and audit of all licensed small-scale mining concessions to build capacity and hold the owners of concessions accountable for illegal mining on their concessions. To this end, we'll engage the large mining companies to seed and release part of their unused concessions, abandoned shafts, pits, or areas for licensed small-scale miners to also earn a living. Land reclamation and our Tree for Life program and our Blue Water initiatives will be key planks of our determination to protect our environment while encouraging sustainable mining for national development. And this is where graduates from UMAT and UNER, that is the, Union of Mine, uh, the University of Mining and Technology, the University of Natural um, uh, and Energy Resources, and other institutions come in which I employ them to support and provide expertise to the mining industry. This support would include setting up environmental and regulatory outfits like the Environmental Protection Agency and the Minerals Commission in all mining districts of Ghana. And coming to local governance, the next NDC government will implement true decentralization and reverse the current centralization of our local government uh, system under this government. <laughs> to provide policy coherence and ministerial oversight, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development will be responsible for sanitation. In other words, the Ministry of Sanitation will be abolished. In the time when we have had a Ministry of Sanitation, our society is even dirtier than it was before. We shall reintroduce the National Sanitation Days and we shall institute the Cleanest City Award Scheme. This award scheme will inject a competitive spirit among our MMDAs and rewards will be given to the cleanest of the MMDAs. We will promote waste to energy projects and ensure that we have recycling capacity for plastics and other uh, uh, garbage in our districts and uh, uh, in our districts and municipalities. To provide adequate funding for local governance, we will abolish the centralized collection of property rates and assist the local government uh, uh, institutions to be able to collect these property rates in order to stimulate local economic growth and diversification for job creation by providing incentives for local level investments and processing under our 24-hour economy policy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you are all aware, under this government, the District Assembly's Common Fund has been reduced from the 7.5 percent as it was in 2016 to currently 5 percent. We will work to raise the allocation to districts back to the 7.5 percent 
it was under the NDC administration. We will have great selected municipalities, included but not limited to Ho, Kaswa, Ashaiman, Techiman, Koforidwa, Sunyane, Bolgatanga, Hohoi, and Wa into metropolitan assemblies. And we'll also upgrade other eligible districts from district assemblies to municipal assemblies. Ladies and gentlemen, assembly members will be paid monthly stipends. I can see there are some assembly members. <laughs> Assembly members will be paid monthly stipends, and this we will use to motivate them to monitor the implementation of government projects and programs within their electoral areas. We are also going to utilize them to collect birth and death statistics in real time in order that we can strengthen our birth and death registry. We will increase the representation of traditional authorities in the decentralized structures, and we would work with them to make sure that their authority is utilized. It is worrying that government has ignored the cries of the chiefs and people in the flood affected areas of the Volta River and the Volta Lake, and has refused till now to offer adequate compensation to them for the destruction that was caused by the spillage. As already promised, an NDC government will right these wrongs. I wish to assure our journalists and media practitioners that we are returning to an era of true media freedom under my presidency. In this new era of media freedom, journalists will not remain in constant fear over state-sponsored attacks on them. Radio stations critical of government are not going to be attacked Rambo style. Journalists will not remain in fear of being attacked to the point that some have to run away and seek asylum in other countries. To promote and guarantee media freedom, expand the frontiers of press freedom, and create a conducive work environment for media practitioners, we will fully implement and operationalize the Right to Information Act, Act 2019, Act of, uh, of 2019, Act 989. We'll reopen the investigation into the murder of Ahmed Hussein Swali. <laughs> and ensure prompt action on all cases involving violation of the rights and freedoms of media professionals. We'll support the Ghana Journalists Association, the National Media Commission, and other stakeholders to promote an enduring professional media environment and improve continuous professional development for media practitioners. And I can assure you, if the president of the Ghana Journalist Association is sitting next to me and he has made a critical statement about me, I'm not going to be angry with him. And <laughs> I will take it in good faith. <laughs> we are determined to pass the broadcasting bill into law and reactivate the Media Development Fund in consultation with the Ghana Journalists Association. And we will support the growth and economic viability of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and other state-owned media outfits. We're not going to privatize state-owned media, not under our watch. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time under the Fourth Republic, Ghana suffered the shame of debt defaults. Our citizens, including pensioners, had their bonds withheld and had very severe haircuts. Even though our external partners have suffered a variant of this crude haircut, the government, I will lead from 7 January 2025, is expected to begin paying for the sins of this government's debt defaults. This means that Ghana's international relations must be stepped up to restore our global influence and enhance our role in international affairs 
as well as ensure maximum, maximum benefits for national development and position ourselves as the favored destination for foreign direct investment in West Africa. Fortunately, unlike my opponent, I'm not a stranger to international relations. I was chair of ECOWAS during periods of crisis, during the Burkina crisis, during the crisis in Gambia, and I was chair of ECOWAS during the crisis of the Ebola pandemic. I will use this experience to hit the ground running and pursue a comprehensive foreign policy that articulates our enlightened national interests and reaffirms our commitment to regional integration, peace, and security, and that appreciates contemporary geopolitical realities and profess strategic engagements for a sustainable world, peace, security, and development. We will intensify economic diplomacy that transits Ghana to a vibrant export trade and foreign investment, and we will appoint trade attaches to specifically designated Ghanaian diplomatic missions to aggressively market Ghana's economic competitiveness. <laughs> Ghana's hosting of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat must be leveraged to reset and accelerate our social economic growth and pivot Ghana as Africa's transport and investment hub. This includes Ghana become, uh, becoming a pharmaceutical manufacturing hub. To foster good neighborliness, I'll reinforce cordial and mutual supportive relations with our immediate neighbors. And I engage in strategic initiatives to facilitate the reintegration of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger back into the ECOWAS. And I will not snitch on our neighbors to any foreign power. I will not snitch on our neighbors to any foreign power. Ladies and gentlemen, to reaffirm our collective commitment to the principles of sub-regional integration and to emphasize Ghana's steadfast commitment to the African Union, we shall pursue this aggressively. Ghanaian nationals abroad should be assured of enhanced consular service with proactive programs that will promote and protect their welfare and rights. And these rights will be inclusive of their participation in our political and socioeconomic development. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not countenance a project that we understand is to outsource our electronic vis uh, visa issuance to an opaque private entity at the expense of our natural interest. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I have shared with you some of the concrete governance proposals that we seek to implement when giving the nod in this year's general elections. I've reiterated that Ghana is at a crossroads because injustice is eating away at our society with our economy inflicting untold hardships on millions of our fellow citizens. I've also reaffirmed my determination to ruthlessly root out the canker of corruption and refresh your memories on a few of the un un uncountable corruption scandals that this administration has tolerated without any sanctions to reset Ghana for equitable opportunities and job creation in a 24-hour economy, we also need to restore public confidence and trust in our governance institutions, which are decaying under our very eyes. And not least among them are our courts. My determination to provide adequate safety and security for all Ghanaians under the 24-hour economy initiative remains unwavering. Let me assure you that we shall build a, re a resilient relationship with citizens and our social partners and will create room for unfiltered and uncensored encounters between me and my vice president-to-be, 
Professor Jane Nana Opokwajima. There will be unfiltered and uncensored encounters between us and moral and civil society. I trust that by working together with the media, our international development partners, civil society organizations, our traditional and religious leaders, and our labor unions, we shall together reset Ghana and begin to relive the dream of Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And as Nkrumah said, I speak freedom. And taking inspiration from Osajifu this evening, I have spoken governance. Let us reset Ghana for good governance and accountability. And may God bless our dear nation, Ghana, and make it great and strong. Thank you very much. And may God bless all of us. Thank you. But let me start with the questions about uh, nepotism. Um, nepotism is a situation in which somebody who has the discretion to make appointments makes those appointments from his own ethnic and familial circle. And so the current portrayal of nepotism in our governance is what is famously called family and friends uh, government. And um, I do think that it's something that we must look at. When we have raised issues about family and friends under this current Akufuado administration, the response we are met with is, I mean, is it, is it the president's fault if he has many qualified people in his family? Uh, who doesn't have many qualified people in his family? We all have many qualified people in our family, but it is ethically wrong to fail government with just people who you have a close relationship with. As I said, I mean, I was open to scrutiny when I was president. The only person linked by blood to me in my government was my current spokesman, Joyce Bao Mukhtari. Aside from that, no blood relation of mine was a minister or a DC or any uh, other such position in my government. And so it's something that we would adhere to. We think that the opportunities of this country should be open to everybody. We have 16 regions, and we must um, ensure, and the Constitution even enjoins us, and says that in making public appointments, we shall take cognizance of regional and gender balance. It's right there in our Constitution. And so I do believe that it is the personal testament of the person who leads, you know, that would avoid nepotism. because. The Constitution gives the President those powers to make those appointments. And one would expect that in making those appointments, he will be fair and he will be balanced and he will open the opportunities for people to serve who are not within his immediate uh, family uh, uh, circle. And so that will be my answer to that uh, question. And then anti-corruption crusaders. Anti-corruption crusaders are going to be our partners because they play a very important role in rooting our corruption. We must not be defensive about the exposure of corruption. We must embrace and welcome the exposure of corruption. And the first step towards rooting our corruption is sunlight, transparency, shining the light into the dark recesses. And that is what we're going to do. We're not going to pursue only post-regime accountability because that has been the nemesis of our governance. But we're going to put, uh, uh, follow post-regime accountability and regime accountability. Because I've said several times that if we are sanctioning people who are leaving government for things that they did that were wrong, we should be prepared to sanction people who do the same things in our own government. And so people who come to serve in the next administration should be prepared to be held accountable by the people of Ghana. 
And that's why I've said we'll give unfettered space for the anti-corruption institutions to do their work. And I've also said that I will know my level and not be a clearing agent. And so when they come and take you and they are going with you, the special prosecutor and all of them, don't count on me to come and protect and save you. I don't think that it's fair to say our local government governance system has not worked, even though the a survey might suggest that. I do believe that the district assembly concept has served as well. And I still believe in NDC, we believe that a non-partisan local government system is still the best way to go. Indeed, that was the difference between us and our colleagues in the MPP, and that's why that particular amendment was dropped. Um, uh, because we had indicated that we're not going to support it. I think more than just partisan um, uh, local government uh, uh, service is the issue of election of DCEs. The majority of Ghanaians believe that DCEs must be held accountable to the people by being elected. And our party has absolutely no aversion to DCEs being elected. But we believe that the DCEs must stand on their own reputation and on their own steam and be voted for. That is where we differ with our colleagues. And I indicated to uh, the president in one of the statements I made that even though they had decided not to go ahead with the referendum on the participation of political parties in local government, I believe that he should still go ahead with the issue of election of DCEs, but on a non-partisan basis, and we will support it. But um, it was decided to drop, it decided to drop the whole issue completely. In the next government, like I said, we're going to look at the whole constitutional review process again. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to take the constitutional review proposals including the white paper that was issued at the time. And we're going to hold a national validation conference where we'll bring all stakeholders together and we'll review the proposals that were made and find out if all of them are still relevant to our current reality. And when we have done that, we will then go back to the constitutional review implementation process. One of the things I think we should do is, we know the, uh, the proposed amendments, take the issues that are not controversial, where we can get bipartisan uh, support, and pass those. And then after that, negotiate the other issues that are more complex and controversial, and see how we can forge a consensus around passing those amendments. For me, that I think is the way uh, forward to, to go. With regards to the peace pact, the point our party was making that is not enough to, with brass band and celebration, gather the whole uh, uh, world, diplomats, traditional leaders, and then us party leaders and presidential candidates will just go and sign a piece of paper that nobody really is committed to implementing. If we sign a peace pact, it must be a serious peace pact, and that everybody who is involved in signing that peace pact is committed to doing the things that will ensure that we have peaceful elections. And that is the point we are making. And so like um, my brother, um, uh, Dr. Kwete said, we think that the peace pact should not only be signed by political party leaders and presidential candidates, we are not the only stakeholders and participants and players in the electoral process. There are other key stakeholders who do not sign the pact and therefore are not committed to what we all sign in the pact. The EC is a key player in elections. They must sign the pact and commit to conducting themselves in a free, transparent and fair election 
in a manner that is not inclined to any one party or any candidate. The IGP is in charge of security. The IGP must sign on behalf of the security services that the security services will act professionally in the, their conduct on the day uh, before, during, and after the election. There are other, the Chief Justice, if there are disputes in the election, they are going to come to the courts. We need the Chief Justice, and Madam Kinsley, now you can inform her, to sign the peace pact. <laughs> that the judges will conduct themselves in a way that when disputes arise from the election, they will fairly adjudicate those disputes in order that it does not lead to crisis. And so like we're saying, there are other stakeholders who must all come on board and let us all sign that peace pact and indicate our commitment to the whole country that we are all committed to a peaceful election. I think that if we do that, it will make that peace pact more meaningful. And we won't have a problem signing a pact like that if we are able to reach that consensus. <laughs> Aunt Esther spoke about NDPC. It has been the Siberia of our democratic governance. When you have removed somebody from a position and you really don't know where to send him, you just parcel him, package him nicely and post him to NDPC. And yet that is supposed to be one of the most critical you know, institutions of our democratic governance in terms of long-term planning. And so we have always taken the peace, um, uh, NDPC seriously. And that's why we've sent some of our best people all the time. Dr. Kwesi Butri was chairman of the NDPC. I mean, the former Minister of Finance, very brilliant lawyer. And so we have always taken it seriously, you know, and we came out before we left office with a 40-year development plan because we realized that that short-term planning was not taking us anywhere. And so extensive consultation was held and we came out with a 40-year development plan. I thought that if a new government came, they will take it and tweak it. Maybe there might be some things they don't agree with. There are some things they agree with, they'll tweak it, but we'll all essentially continue to follow on that path. The nemesis of our economic progress is the start and stop, start and stop uh, that we adopt in our economic planning. Lo and behold, 40-year development plan was shunted aside, and some plan called Ghana Beyond Aid which landed us in the deepest aid debt hole we have ever experienced was brought to replace it. Recently, I hear that this government is trying to put some long-term development plan in place. We are happy to look at the work they've done and get our people to join and work and see how we can, by consensus, agree across partisan lines a national development plan that all of us would follow, no matter which party comes into office. We're social democrats, we're social democrats, they are conservatives, they might want to tweak something or other there, but I think that we must agree on the foundation and the basis of our long-term plan, which we all agree to. And no matter which government comes into office, we'll just continue to m measure uh, have good measurables to be able to see the progress we are making, whether in 40 years or 50 years or whatever the period of the plan should be. The issue of unemployment is a very complex issue. We have a fast growing population and so the number of young people uh, is growing very fast. It is determined that more than 65% of our population is under 35. And with the senior, free senior high school, we're having more of our young people pass through secondary school. And many of them are coming out either hoping to go to university or if they are not able to go to university after senior high school, they are looking for a blue colored job or a white colored job or something like that. And so it is a crisis that we are faced with. Um, people say it is something that's advantageous, but at the same time, if your growth is not keeping up 
with that, the growth of that segment of your population, then you're sitting on a ticking time bomb. And that is where our problem is. Our growth has been inconsistent because a faster growth of the economy naturally throws up jobs in the job market. And so how do we accelerate our growth so that money is circulating, businesses are being established, and people are getting employment? No artificial job mechanisms will work. NAPCO and all those things, they are palliatives. It's just like putting plaster on the wound. It is not going to cure the wound unless you put medicine on it. And so we must look at the things that will create more jobs in the space. And that's why we've come out with uh, our suggestion. And everybody is entitled to his. And our suggestion is that even with the existing businesses, if we incentivize them to increase production and go beyond the eight hour working uh, uh, period, even if it's for 16 hours, it will encourage them to take on more uh, people. Can we create a safe environment where pharmacies and other services are working more than eight hours a day and being able to employ more of our young people? How do we invest in agriculture and agribusiness so that we can create the processing capacity to employ more young people? What are the things that we must invest in to create more entrepreneurs amongst our young people? Not everybody who comes out of a, a school must be destined to be employed by somebody. There are others who could be empowered to become entrepreneurs. And that's why when we're in government, we established the Ghana Exim Bank it was supposed to assist young businesses to be able to grow. Unfortunately, it's become a trust fund for political apparatchiki instead of being used for what it was supposed to be used for. And so we're going to go back to the basics and see how we can stimulate all these engines in order that we're generating more jobs. How many people can the public sector employ? Not more than, currently I think there are about 900,000 employees in the public sector out of a population of 33 million. And so naturally, the biggest or the largest capacity for job creation is in the private sector and self-employment. Aside from that, we need to tweak our skill sets because we're producing too many people in the humanities and in management. And so everybody is doing an MBA, everybody is doing marketing, everybody is doing, you know, some, so there's a saturation of graduates in those sectors. And yet you go and find out there's a deficit of middle level technicians. People are looking for very skilled electricians. They're looking for very skilled plumbers. They're looking for very skilled welders and we don't have enough of them. And so how do we tweak our skill sets so that our young people are going into those areas where employment generation is easier than everybody going to do an MBA, everybody going to do business management, everybody going to do marketing, everybody going to do history and all that. And so that is one of the things that we need to look at. The way we can do it is to increase capacity in vocational and technical training. And so for some of our secondary schools, we must convert them into technical and vocational training schools so that people can finish JHS and say, look, I want to go into a technical and vocational school because I want to learn a skill, get a certificate, and go into the world of work. And they should be able to do that. And so those are the reforms that we'll look at and seek to uh, implement. Um, will we consult health professionals in uh, appointments? To, I didn't really understand uh, the question. To which I did like the uh, head, director general of the Ghana Health Service. We should call all health professionals together and ask them, who do you want to be the director general of the Ghana <laughs> Health Service? You know, some of those appointments are the prerogative of the president. He will consult as far as possible in order to get a good person to be there. But you cannot universally consult in order to fill one position or the other. And so what we must look for is people who have merit and people who can bring a change to where you're posting them to. 
and not just bring people because their political party affiliates and so on and so forth. You might have a person who can achieve results for you in a particular area. He's not partisan, but the work that he does would be a credit to your political party because it will bring quality and uh, uh, progress into the area. With health professionals, we will always need health professionals. And um, that is one of the reasons that we were expanding the infrastructure in the healthcare space. You know, by building more chips compounds, by building more polyclinics, by building more hospitals, so that we could create more space for uh, absorbing health, uh, health professionals as they come uh, out of school. And so, once that expansion is taking place, there will be a demand and a need for, for them. But I have said that even as we're employing health professionals, we must also be taking into consideration where we have an excess of health professionals to see how we can sign agreements with foreign countries, allow them to go on fixed term migration uh, service, go and work for four or five years, gain some experience, and come back home. They'll come back home with more experience and come and join the service again. And so helping nurses to improve their qualification and experience to be able to go and work outside for a period of time and come back is something that we will also consider even as we're doing yearly postings of these professionals as they come out of school. And so um, that's, I think, is how we we'll work on it. Um, my comrade Bampo um, spoke about equal work for equal pay. This is what we worked on for many years as the universal pay structure, which is the single spine. And after arduous negotiations, we eventually came out with the Ghana universal salary structure, which was the, famously called the single spine. Since we left office, I hear the single spine no longer exists. The spine is broken <laughs> because some people have been taking off the spine and their services have been improved, while others have been left marking time. And so what we're trying to achieve by equality in terms of work and pay has been dislodged again. And so you go to some uh, public offices, same proficiency, same qualifications, same skill, but one, because they are a secretary in a certain establishment, and three times what their colleague in other establishments earn. It's unfair, it's unjust, and that is what we try to cure by the GUSS. But we will listen to labor, and we will work with you, you are our partners, and see what we can do to come up with a fair remuneration system in the public uh, services. You cannot get complete equality, but at least you can get fairness in terms of how people are remunerated in the public uh, service. And with Reverend Benson, pastors are suffering. <laughs> and I've always said that our pastors are among the first to notice when the economy is declining. Aggregation is dwindling. You will see it in the collection bowl. You will see it. <laughs> the metamorphosis of 10 CD and 5 CD notes and 1 CD notes will be very obvious. And you see a very visible absence of 50s and 100s and 200 notes. Then you know that sometimes you even see coins in the collection bowl then you know that the economy is in crisis. And so, like Pastor said, NDC is going to come and work. Our first priority will be to stabilize the macroeconomy and then also stabilize the depreciation of the CD because the depreciation of the currency has an effect on every other sector of the uh, uh, economy. And so if we're able to do that and we accelerate the growth of our country and we're able to bring in more inward investment this government has sacked most of the players in the upstream sector for eight years. There has been no single addition to our oil and gas production. And yet we're in, in the transition period for oil and gas. This is the time we should be pumping that oil and gas like crazy. 
because the transition is happening, we're going into cleaner energy, and a time will come when you have what we call stranded assets. Stranded assets are what will happen when the world has done the transition into renewable energy and you have oil in the ground, but it's of no use to anybody. And so we must encourage our partners to work assiduously to come and increase oil and gas production. We must get the ENIs of this world to come. We have a shortfall in gas production. And so what is making our electricity more expensive is that we're having to import liquid uh, uh, crude oil to fire some of the thermal plants. Just the building, a turbo gas processing plant is the most transformational investment that has been made in this country in, as, after Akosombo, that is the next most transformational plant that investment that has been made. And thank the memory of our late president, uh, uh, President John Atamelos for that. I came and continued and commissioned it. But that plant is saving us more than $500 million every year, which we would have used to pay for crude oil. And if we're able to increase and bring on a second gas train, Talo uh, has more gas to bring on board. If we get ENI to come back and you know, also uh, uh, drill and produce more gas, it will bring the cost of uh, electricity down. And it will increase the non-tax revenue that we get. We must invest in the cocoa sector, stop the mismanagement in the cocoa sector. The headquarters of Cocoa Board alone spent 3.4 billion CDs in one year. I mean, why? Are you growing the cocoa trees in Cocoa House or what? And meanwhile, the share of the farmer dwindled to its lowest. And so the farmers had no incentive to look after the cocoa farms. And so we should rather change it. The amount spent on headquarters must come down. The amount spent on the farmers must go up so that they can invest in the farms and make sure that we're able to export and bring more uh, money in. And so we should be able to do all that so that we can grow the economy. And once the economy is growing, more people are having money in their pockets. Reverend uh, Benson, you're going to see that the collections are going to start coming back to, to normal. Um, my brother, I win a bit, and uh, I told him that now that they've been disqualified, they should just come and join us <laughs> and let us win this election. We are comrades, after all, we are both social democratic parties. You know, I think it was quite unfair the disqualification, disqualification of uh, the PNC, and uh, unfortunately, they sought justice from the courts and again they were denied but um, I do think that uh, uh, better luck next time uh, we will receive you, we we'll invite you and uh, we'll go on campaign with you <laughs> and uh, when we win you are our partners we will work together to reset this country and reset Ghana um, Comrade Awingobi talked about taxes and a fixed rate. I didn't talk about taxes because this is just a forum on governance. We're going to have a forum on the economy and under that we're going to talk about taxes. But just to assure you, we have said we are going to introduce a fixed rate policy for a period so that there will be more predictability in how much people are going to pay from when they import their goods to when they clear them. But apart from that, we're going to help people so that they are able to clear their things in good time. And that's why we said that we're going to license some financial institutions to work with government. And so if your container is coming, you know you don't have the money to pay the duty when the container lands. You go into an agreement with these financial institutions. They will pay uh, the duties on your behalf. They will lift your container into their terminal and they'll give you a period to pay in installments. And once you finish paying, you can take your container. And so we want to do that to ease the pressure on uh, businesses and importers. 
With the assets declaration, it is going to be part of the review we do of the constitution or, or, and the laws because the current law does not permit publishing of the assets declaration. And of course, we do know that it makes it not as effective as it should be. And so we should look at the law, and if we amend it, then we can uh, have the um, uh, Auditor General uh, publish the assets declaration. I'm not averse to it, but um, you cannot compel people unlawfully to have their assets uh, published when the law does not make provision uh, for it. And so we'll do, go through the constitutional review together. And if we all agree that, yes, once assets declarations are filed, the audit, Auditor General should publish them, then I think that that would be the way to go. So thank you. I think that's the last question.